our mission and our vision. So I will do the final wrap-up, and before I say my scripted words, I was just telling Natasha earlier that when I was approached about this job, I was told they wanted somebody who was equally comfortable in a campground, as well as at the UN, so somebody who could have a bit of fun. So it is my duty right now to put on the sorting hat. <laughs> um, and if you want to see real pictures from Harry Potter World, come see me afterwards. Um, we, st sorry, we started... Um, by talking about the Crystal Palace rally. So if you zoom forward 100 plus years, there are other, as it were, female icons, and we want to talk about um, Hermione. So for over 100 years, we've developed girls as leaders, have made a difference in our communities, and shaped the world so that girls now are so much more likely to reach their fullest potential than ever before. So Hermione Granger from Harry Potter, the character of Hermione carries a very important role. She's described as the brightest character a very strong female character, and at the same time, she is friends with the boys and is on an adventure with them. The same as we do in the Europe region with our colleagues in Wazen. She was little know-it-all, also with some insecurity and a great fear of failure beneath. Hermione hopped on a train and started her journey at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, and Hogwarts helped her transform and become a leader, and it developed her fullest potential, the same as we do at WAG. So it's a great delight that I now hand over to our amazing colleagues at the New York Region and the New York Committee to take you on the rest of that train journey and wear the hat. So, like us in the Europe Region WAGs, Hermione has been on a journey, starting with taking the train to Hogwarts School. Same like Hermione, our journey started in Berlin 2013, and you might remember that then we used the train um, as a symbol for the journey we're going to take in the Triennium. Then in Berlin in 2013, a new Europe region membership strategy, a new Europe region membership development strategy was voted on during the conference. We will now go through this journey and see what we have achieved in this triennium. On this train journey, we have worked on actions and activities. It was an adventure, and we have managed to accomplish many achievements that we will see now. So, we work in our strategy around three topics, gendered leadership, growth, diversity, and the cross-cutting approach, vibrancy. We developed a strategy on diversity, an approach to gender, mainstreaming, and plans for tailored support in many MOs, and a report on the impact of guiding and scalping. This we did together with Bosom. We developed further our tailored support through mentoring. We developed further communication, the partnership with VOSM, external work, such as the European Youth Forum, Advisory Council on Youth, and advocacy work. We also developed further the partnership with VOSM, with the Academy, the IC Forum, the Chief Volunteers Event, the Chief Executives Event, and Roverway. We had pilot projects on gendered leadership and growth with the North Star technology. We had our first Europe region NLDP event, and we had loads and loads of discussions, emails, challenges, but also successes, memorable moments, and fun. we believe in the magic of girl guiding and girl scouting to transform the lives of our members and because we want more and more people across our continent to experience that magic that's why we want to grow the 
But at the start of the triennium, well, the signpost shows a bit how we felt about growth. We wanted to grow the region whilst improving the quality of guidance. But this growth thing, well, we couldn't quite get hold of it. We wanted to build on the past work. We wanted to start in new countries. We wanted to support existing <coughs> countries to grow. And we wanted to do lots, but where to start? So we started a pilot to try to find a way forward. And this was based on the world work done with North Star. The main purpose of this research was to identify key barriers to growth in the region and find a way to address these. And Sharon's going to cover this much more in a moment. We developed mentoring to have more sustainable and consistent ways of work. And at the World Conference in Hong Kong, we grew when we were excited to have Armenia become a full member. But this wasn't really enough. We realised we needed to do more about growth. We couldn't rely on North Star for everything. Some other MOs were conducting research as well. And therefore, we wanted to have a more hands-on, a more proactive approach to growth. <laughs> A different type of support seemed to be needed. And as a committee in June 2015, we agreed that growth sat with mentoring and that the remit of that group would be broadened. This coincided with the Global Growth Roundtable. And during the autumn, we had lots of ideas and lots of dreams to grow guiding. The core group of Stina from Denmark, Paula from Finland and Jess from the UK, together with Sharon, myself, Maria Drell and Manuela, we met and we tried to make a plan. We didn't want to just have ideas, for the ideas to be some kind of bucket list for Europe region. We wanted to bring some order to the ideas and we created a plan and we wanted to make the ideas happen. And so did the world. We all wanted to deliver the membership strategy agreed at the World Conference. We all wanted to make ideas for growth happen and we teamed up. And now you can see how our growth work has developed in our region of Europe. This is our growth journey since 2000. And you can see, I hope it's really clear, we've had an explosion of work on growth in the last year. But let's just go back a bit and remember our journey. In the first triennium of the 2000s, we started with the growth strategy. We did some work jointly with WASM through the growth network. We had our own working groups. We had the joint JUMP event, and for those who don't remember JUMP, it was in 2012, and it was an event aimed at supporting MOs to ensure that young, all young people had the opportunity to, to participate in Girl Guiding and Girl Scouting. In the last triennium, the committee also visited, did 30 visits to 25 countries, and mostly these were focused on growth. I hope on our journey picture, you can see how mentoring has developed over the years, from the development of the Mentoring in a Nutshell um, publication, through the start of assignments for mentoring with MOs, the first two happened in the triennium 2007-2010. It grew further in the last triennium, and now we move to the current one. We agreed at the last conference to grow the mentoring work, and this has happened. And you can spot mentors and mentees by those of us wearing these red badges. Please come and find out more. We currently have 10 mentoring assignments in our region. They're mostly focused on growth and some on the induction of new ICs. Mentoring has been very successful and we have established consistent processes and a strong group of mentors. And we are ready to do more. So let's talk now about the explosion of activity in the last year. Well, this has been the most exciting of times for growth in our region. Firstly, we wanted to share the successes of many member organisations who have grown and who have found new and different ways to grow. We commissioned a piece of work, which in fact was carried out by a WAGS IC in her professional capacity, Irene from Austria, and we have um, compiled 15 success stories which are, we're ready to share. They're each published as a case study and they're also published as a one-page graphic. So you know what to look for in our gold mine in the library, they look like this. So thank you to the MOs who've participated in this. We have scheduled a series of webinars to run through the second half of this year and we will use the Global Hub to deliver these. 
So please sign up to the Hub and encourage people in your MO to do likewise. We all know the power of sharing good news and sharing and celebrating one another's successes. Please follow us on social media where we've started to share stories as part of the Growth 2020 series. The Global Rapid Response Team has explored the development of guiding in five countries across our region and indeed it's exciting, as Anita said, to have some of them present with us. The group of mentors felt that there's a wealth of ideas and good practice in existing WAGS publications, but it's all too easy to lose track of what is where and what publication they're in. So we've started to develop some easy to use one page flowcharts to maximize the benefit of the existing WAGS material. The first couple are in the library for you to look at. We'd really appreciate your feedback, for example, on the flowchart around how to recruit adult volunteers. It's a prototype and we're planning to have a series, so we really need your feedback. We have the learnings from the North Star pilot project that Sharon will share in a moment, and these will feed into the wider growth work now that the pilot's nearing completion. We've summarised the learnings we have gathered from the success stories and from the analytical work done based on the member organisation membership survey data. To find out more about these learnings, look out for a short document that will be published later this month. These are the headlines that we found in the analysis. So we started the training, I'm not sure how to get hold of this thing called growth. And now we're in a much stronger position. We have much to share and much more to do. I'd like to thank the mentors and the core group of Stina, Paola and Jess. We want to do more and move forward with a broader and expanded offering of tailored support rather than mentoring. This will encompass coaching, training and mentoring. We're looking forward to working more closely with the Rapid Response Team, to sharing your success stories, to supporting us all to make best use of WAG's resources. We're not only looking to work with the world, but also to engage effectively across regions, particularly Africa, to leverage research and best practice for the benefit of our region. Later in the conference, we have workshops on the future strategy, and we will run a workshop on growth and a workshop specifically on tailored support. Please do come along and contribute so that we can all move forward together to allow more people to have the magic of girl guiding and girl scouting in our region. Thank you. Uh, as um, Amanda has just uh, said, this triennial, we decided to take a different approach to growth. And we decided to look a bit and reflect on what we have done so far on growth. So far, we realized that we always took an approach where we involved all our member organizations together, the 39 MOs. And we realized that that's was too overwhelming and we didn't really get the results that we wanted. So this time in this triangle, we decided to focus on a different way. And the and what we what we agreed on was to focus um, working on with a smaller group. So um, this is why we call it the pilot project. Work with countries with potential for growth and most importantly generate learning to share this, this knowledge and about the research. The other thing that we focused on was to learn more about what really supports the MO from a research perspective and also from an analysis perspective and to maintain the quality and the experience for the girls. Another thing that we looked at is not reinventing the wheel. So we, we looked at using the North Star research methodology, following the partner research that was carried out at a world level. Of course, tailor making it for our region. How did we go about it? This is the process that we used. So an invitation was sent to all of you, to all the member organizations. We received an overwhelming response of how many MOs were interested in growth, 
The only unfortunate thing was that not every member organization had the manpower, key volunteers, to drive this work. So we managed to come, come up with four countries that really wanted to go for the pilot project. And uh, in total, we had six MOs. The countries uh, that, that participated in this uh, pilot were Romania, Slovenia, Ireland, we had two associations, and Norway, we also had two associations. We, following, the, following this, we signed an agreement with the pilot MOs. We identified the key volunteers at a national level from each country that will work with us on the project and will drive the work. And then we started with a pre-assessment. We had an event in Slovenia where we had various partners taking part. So we had the pilot countries. Uh, I was there as the, as the lead for the project and uh, with the support of the office, Maria Joao. And we also had someone, the, one of the directors from North Star who, who led the research. The idea of this meeting was to Built, it was capacity building, so the idea was to empower these uh, member organizations to be able to carry out the research. Training was also carried out with regards to the, how the research will be, will be tackled, and a plan was carried out as well uh, with time frames, with um, a, a full plan from the start of the research till the end of the, of the pilot. The pilot countries then had a couple of months um, to conduct the research and following the research we uh, also gave the opportunity to the pilot countries to have a Skype call with North Star where they could um, ask questions or um, show any concerns and get further support and encouragement and motivation. From, from uh, a committee side, from my side and from the office, we also ensured that there was a constant communication with these pilot countries to ensure that, that the process is, is still ongoing. And then we had another meeting where we went through, the, uh, all the pilot countries came, came over with the research, with the results, and the idea was to disseminate the information. Following that, before leaving the event, there were two other tasks. One was to make a plan of how to generate growth. And the second was ideas how we can now cascade this valuable information and methodology to the rest of the member organizations. Why was, why was this research special and different? We used an innovative approach. We used, when it, when it came to research, we used four voices. So the research, which was a mix of qualitative and quantitative research, we had, we interviewed, uh, the pilot countries interviewed four voices, which were the stakeholders, which were individuals in positions of authority and influence. Parents, again, also broken down to um, those parents who have their children or uh, uh, in, in the association, in WEGS, or uh, if they don't as well. We also uh, looked at members, and again, this was broken down to current, labs, potential, and uninvolved members, and we did the same with volunteers. So this, this proved, from the experience that we got from, from the project, this proved to be uh, a, a very innovative way of carrying out the research, because we got to know information that in the past we never managed to get because the research was carried out in a different manner. Following, following the research, from experience, from the readings and from the research we made uh, from past projects on growth, one of the stumbling blocks is usually when you have a lot of information and you don't know what to do about it. So it is overwhelming. So in the second meeting, Together with North Star, we helped the pilot countries funnel the information that was gathered from the four voices. So the stakeholders, the parents, the members, and the volunteers. What did they tell us? And then we funneled it to three key areas. What to keep? What are they telling us? What are these four voices telling us? What should we keep? What should we refine? And what we should change? 
So, and this, this proved to be, from the feedback we got from the pilot countries, this proved to be a very helpful exercise, and this led to the ability of making a concrete plan how to move forward. So these are the, this is a summary of the findings in Europe. So uh, as you can see, the information is funneled into what they should retain, what they should refine, and what they should reconsider. I will not go through the detail at this point, but what I can say is that two common aspects that came out from the four countries was related to program that um, there, 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 was a, there, there was a need, the voices, the four voices said that we could do with refining the program that we offer for our members. And the top on the list was improving visibility. This was a clear, this was a, a cross-cutting uh, feedback that, we, that all the pilot countries actually got. So as I said, I'm not going to go into the detail of the findings. However, uh, tomorrow morning um, at 9, there's going to be a series of workshops, and one of the workshops is going to be purely on the North Star pilot project. And I'm very, very happy to say that the four pilot countries are actually with us here, and uh, they are going to be sharing the hands-on uh, experience on this project. They will be explaining how they conducted the research, what to avoid, what are the learnings, what you should do um, uh, as, as a learning, and also we will also explain how the plan was carried out following the funneling of the information. Lastly, but most important, most important, we would like, when you come to this workshop, to have your feedback. What, how would you like us to share this information with you? We have some ideas which we are going to be sharing in tomorrow's workshop as to possibilities of having, for example, um, body systems, so one of the pilot countries could support you in the process, have another workshop, have another process as a, as a region, so the, the opportunities are, uh, are there. But we would like to hear your feedback as well in this workshop. So I, I, if you are interested in growth, and if you are interested in this, uh, uh, to learn more about this methodology, we invite you to come tomorrow at 9 at the workshop on North Star. Thank you. at this topic with that deep insight and with such intimacy of all attendees. Amongst others, I can see and feel now how often fear just let us commit to things we really don't want. And I really learned to step into it and try to convince everyone else that it is worth the effort. Furthermore, my colleague and I are still waving the gender issues flag anywhere we can, and I think we definitely made a change at some point in our organisation. 
Parenthes says, my colleague also started gender studies, smiling. <laughs> when we started this triennium, we had no plan, we had no experience, and we had no clear direction. We also didn't really have any funding because we had to apply for all the funding. So we weren't sure where we were going to end up. And here we are three years later. Little by little, we started by exploring, testing, talking to people, and trying to understand where we really were. Where were the member organizations in their work on gender? Two things became clear quite quickly. There's no systematic, strategic work done on gender in any of our member organizations. There are isolated projects, but the kind of mainstreamed uh, approach throughout all the work, we haven't found so far in any organization. If you want to challenge me on this and come and say that you are doing it, I'd be really happy to hear that, but so far we haven't found it. The second thing was that we have to explain why gender work is so essential. And the basic summary is that if we want to reach our fullest potential and if we want to grow as an organization we have to work with gender it's as simple as that we are gender biased in society and we take society with us into guiding and scouting so just as gender biased as we are in society at large we are in guiding and scouting the big difference, the really big difference, is where most others can only talk, we can walk the talk, because we have a unique strength. We have millions of members we can work with. We can make a change. We can work on this topic, and all the millions of girls can get new perspectives, and we can challenge these young girls to really reach their fullest potential beyond gendered barriers. This is necessary to just the same extent in co-educational as in single-sex settings. This triennium, we, is, we established the first ever strategy on gender. Uh, the key focus is on awareness raising, because still we need to understand why this is so important and how it impacts us, and it's on mainstreaming. Gender is not a side project that you should work with on the side and have someone, a smaller group, working on gender. Gender should be there when you plan your programme, when you do your training, and it should be there when we uh, look into our membership development. Gender affects who comes and joins us, and gender impacts who decides to leave. And working with gender is working with growth. So, from being fewer and smaller, we want to be more and bigger. On the awareness, uh, we've been delivering events, workshops, we've delivered a lot of different materials, we've trained trainers, we've visited national boards, we started pilots with different member organisations, we've established a separate gender task force with the most amazing regional volunteers ever, uh, we set clear focus in the communication that we have through social media. We collaborated with universities. You just met Michelle Paul here. Uh, and Amanda will share a little bit uh, on that in a minute. We've trained more than 300 people and we have delivered over 3,000 hours of training in this triennium on gender. I think that's worth an applause. <laughs> We also uh, participated in external conferences and advocacy events from Strasbourg in the west to Azerbaijan in the east. On mainstreaming, um, we have uh, together jointly with the Diversity Task Force uh, proudly developed a tool that we are launching here on this conference. If you haven't seen this, uh, and this is the first time, I hope you're going to see a lot more of it. We're going to deliver more workshops on uh, how to use this. We're going to really push for implementing this model, and it's going to help you to bring gender into every aspect of your member organisation, just as you can do that to your members and your local troops. 
We've also uh, launched it slowly with a pilot with all the Nordic countries who have all committed in collaboration with Europe WAGS region to uh, work with us in national projects over a three year period. So in parallel with developing it, we already start to ensure that it's rolling out and getting feedback on how it works. We've also said that the whole region shall be mainstream. That's very ambitious and it's quite hard. It's not easy to fix for us either, even if we want to. As a first step in that, we uh, had a training of all the facilitators on Rogerway, uh, who all got a full day in training uh, on gender issues. Going back to the message from the uh, participant at the Helsinki Gender event, he further down wrote that during our conversation in Helsinki, I really thought hard if I had ever encountered any bad experiences regarding this topic we discussed, and I came to the conclusion that I never had. But looking back now, maybe I was just scared that the world around me isn't like I've imagined, and my consciousness wasn't ready for this to accept, or even try to look into it. One and a half years later with reflection, Amanda. project that Michelle spoke about and I just want to take a couple of minutes to give a different input. Oh, not that input though. <laughs> the project used an approach called participatory action research and this can be used on any topic, it's not about gender. The approach, we really encourage member organisations to find out about it, it can be used at a very local level or at a national level. And, and it involves a relatively small number of people and it's well proven outside of Girl Guided and Girl Scouting. The project was a partnership between ourselves and Oxford Brooks and between two MOs, Scouting Netherlands and Girl Guided UK in the shape of Scotland. And we got results in a very short time, six months. There were 10 key findings, hence the numbers that were on the slide. I'm not going through them all. That's what you find out if you come to the uh, workshop in the morning. Yeah, excellent. Um, we have produced a two-page summary report, which again is in the gold mine of a library, and we have produced a full report. So we wanted to share what the two member organisations or two countries are looking to do with the findings. I apologise for the slide, I have no idea why it's come up a bit wonky. Um, but what you can see is that both countries are intending to take the work forward and in particular it really talks to leadership, it talks to advocacy work. For the region it feeds into the gender strategy that the gender task force deliver. The uh, lead volunteers for both countries are here, Marilyn for Scouting Netherlands and Emma from, from Scotland. Emma's also on the task force, so we're pretty comfortable that the work feeds through and it all flows well together. For other member organisations, please come to the session tomorrow, hear what we can recommend from our experience, not just of leadership, but of the methodology. Thank you. So now we can proudly present, and now I'm probably going backwards, uh, a film premiere, the first time ever. We've developed a film, and this is bridging to the next presentation from ERI, so it's a collaboration between the gender and the diversity work. It's not a feel-good film, it's a film that we hope that you will be able to bring back to your members and discuss 
how diversity and gender impacts our membership, who wants to join and who leaves our movement and why is that. So please roll the film for the first time ever. <laughs> Together in WADS, we're all girl guides and girl scouts that want to get together to have an empowering experience. And that is one of the amazing things about our organization. But we forget each person has a different journey to arrive at WADS and that we all come from different backgrounds. And unfortunately, on this journey, we all gather labels in our backpacks. Some we like, but others are put there without us knowing. When I first arrived, these labels were the only thing my leader saw, and I was judged by them. The labels then got so big that they did not let me be myself and stop me from doing the things I liked. It almost made me quit, not wanting to be in a place where I didn't feel safe. And this happens to a lot of members like me, and many of us leave. And when I ask the leader why, she does not know, but I do. My friend Elo, for example, likes to be adventurous, but our leader does not let us go outside. She thinks we'd rather stay indoors because we're girls. My friend Sam is shy and strong and does not like it when our leader makes her compete. I don't think she has the win to become a leader. My friend Taylor wants to join us at our camping, but she does not feel welcomed in the campfire when the leader does not include her. I don't want to feel judged and excluded. I want the opportunity to be a part of WAX for who I am, because I like the things we do and my friends here. We need a way forward that helps us see every member for who they are. And there's a way to do that, and it's called diversity and gender mainstreaming. It's a strategy that helps us by analyzing and then finding ways for every member to be treated based on individual needs without them being distorted by prejudice, ignorance, or routines. We need to be working right now. Everyone has a responsibility to create a more inclusive environment. For me, for my friends, and for future members. Let's take action. national, local, uh, regional, global. So um, we are behind of time, so I will be quick. Um, when I was first assigned to deal with the diversity, I have to confess that I had no idea about what to do and not a lot of experience in working on diversity. I read many documents and there were different pieces of information around from the MOs, from the Overture Network, from events, etc and I had to find a way to compile and make a strategy. The main idea was to focus on the MOs and what they need. So we decided to consult all of you. We established a task force after a call that went out to all the MOs. I was very anxious and to be honest, so relieved when I realized that you had then lent us your great experts. So we met and built the questionnaire for the consultation, having in mind that we want to get out of it information to ensure that the next strategy will be according to your needs. And we started the consultation phase where the task force members had calls with 28 MOs. We took the results and made the consultation report after identifying common needs, interests, expertise, and best practices but also challenges. Taking into consideration these results and analyzing them, we also took the input of an external expert that confirmed us that we are on the right track and we built the strategy. The strategy has three main milestones. C, change and reach out. C is to map and raise awareness on diversity and inclusion. 
Change is to support you to change mindset on diversity and make decisions that will prepare you to reach out to diverse groups. And Reach Out is about activities aimed at providing adequate training in order to foster large-scale changes at local level to ensure actual diversity and inclusion in guiding and scouting. Of course, in parallel with this, we did put resources on the Overture Network. It is an informal network dedicated to working on diversity. Task Force members attended and inputted on the network and gathered information that in the future will help us to make it more visible and more effective in its work. We had to face the intensive need for mainstreaming diversity as well as gender in the life of each member organization. So a meeting between the two task forces happened to develop the mainstreaming tool. The tool is ready. We will gather feedback during the conference and complete a manual with concrete suggestions and explanations on how to use the tool in different aspects of the life of the association. And then, plan to start in autumn, we will implement this manual with a group of MOs. So please come to me or Catherine or any of the diversity task force members that are around in the conference if you are interested in joining this exciting pilot project. More information will follow on the breakout sessions tomorrow and the next day, and you will find more during this conference, so please have your ears and eyes open. Thank you. Vibrancy is all about adding value to the work of our member organizations and increasing the quantity of opportunities available as a cross-cutting team to growth, gender and diversity. It helps the region and the MOs to develop their relationship and commitment in Europe, responding to the membership strategy. As a region in this triennial, we have worked on various projects in relation to vibrancy and now I'm going to go through them. I would like to start with the regional governance. As you know, um, in our region we have the steering committee that comprises of the chair and the vice chair of the region, together with the regional director. The committee met six times during this triennium to review progress and to also prepare the, for the committee meetings. The Europe committee met six times throughout the triennium to plan and discuss the progress and challenges at regional level and to also identify what the member organizations could benefit from in terms of support and collaboration. Between meetings, the, co the committee also had various sky calls, monthly sky calls, to co follow the progress on events, projects, and activities. We also had in this triennium an opportunity to exchange as well with the world level. World level was also part of our meetings, with five of the meetings that we had being attended by Nicola, the chair of the World Board, and different meetings attended by Anita, our CEO, Elisa, and Andy, um, from directors from the World Bureau. We promised a vibrant presence at the World Conference in Hong Kong, and we surely really had a great magenta presence for those who were there. The World Conference was a great opportunity for you, for the member organizations, to have meetings between the region and uh, committee members, and to also network within, within each other. It was also an opportunity for MOs to attend the extraordinary general meeting, where you approved the financial reports, as agreed in the conference in Berlin. And the member organizations, as a committee, we took the opportunity to also inform you about the progresses and achievements. I think we all agree that we had a really great meeting in Hong Kong. Another, another project that we worked through in this triennium was in line with the commitment that we made in 2013 to visit all the 39 member organizations. During this triennium, the European region WEGS visited 19 member organizations and was represented at several networking meetings, like the German-speaking conference, the Nordic conference, the Lisboa group meeting, and others. Through this triennium, the region 
has worked with an outstanding teams of volunteers. In fact, during this time, we worked with a total of 49 outstanding and accountable team of volunteers in various core groups, resource pools, and task force. This pool of people have all delivered amazing and great results for girl guiding and girl scouting. So I would like to give them a big thanks, just a quick clap for all the volunteers. And some of you, I see some of you here. Thank you very much for the valuable work. Apart from the specific projects, the team of volunteers also had the opportunity to meet as a group. We had the volunteers meeting in May 2015. We had facilitators training for uh, Rover Way facilitators last month, and also a meeting for the communications team. Speaking about the communications team, the communications team, I'm sure you've seen things happening on Facebook. They had a meeting to develop key messages for their guiding and girl scouting. A plan was developed and later approved by the European Union Committee. And as a result, you now, this is one example here, you see uh, constant different messages on a monthly basis and also uh, depending on what, what is going on. This has really improved our presence on social media and uh, the journey will continue in this regard. I would like to also mention the external relations team that uh, represents works uh, in uh, different European conferences and seminars at a European level. Another first that we had this in this triennium was an IC forum at the IC forum in January was a work zone day. We took the decision to offer this possibility for the ICs, uh, the WEBS ICs, to have a web zone day. During this day, the debate that was discussed was related to the direction that WEBS is moving to, including the staff restructuring. In the afternoon, the ICs also had the opportunity to be part of the decision-making process with regards to the strategy, and the information that we gather from these workshops is reflected in the actual strategy that we are presenting in this conference. Another project that we worked on during this uh, triennium in relation to vibrancy is the partnership with WUSIN. However, Pascal will go into more detail on this, so I will not go into detail. These are some, some, uh, some of the feedback, highlights of the feedback we got from you as member organizations, which is really good feedback about the events that 100% of the MOs and regional volunteers found the events at regional level as relevant as, and important, and we had 33 MOs participating in different events. Last but not least, this year, in this training, we had the first ever leadership development training, train the trainer. It was our flagship event based on the National Leadership Development Program that is coming, has, has come out from the WEGS Leadership Development Program. Program and the idea of this program is to develop capacity building to strengthen national boards and to support national leaders and trainers. I must say that this was a very successful event and uh, we are still following up the participants. We have 31 participants from 22 different countries and we are still following them up and I am very proud to say that most of the, of the participants are following up and using the NLDP in their, in their member organization in relation to training, to revisiting training, to leadership training, and also to review training schemes. The leadership development uh, event had also a focus on gender. Looking into the future, a vibrant WEX Europe adding value to be inspirational and relevant to its diverse membership. So moving forward to this triennium, we'll continue to work on similar projects and initiatives to ensure that we remain vibrant, relevant, and inspirational to our diverse membership. Thanks. Don't worry, are you awake? Job work, short word, so I keep it short. 
So the joint work never been a black and white story, nor a purple or magenta one, but a strategic partnership. A partnership in which we are working towards the following two strategic outcomes. The development of effective and sustainable guiding and scouting uh, associations, valuing the contribution of youth and adult volunteering, including skills development and employability. The key achievement of this work in partnership was the signing of the MOU in June 2014 in Brussels. The MOU, why do we do this? It's to support Wax and WASM in improving our ways of working together and ensuring the effectiveness of their activities with a focus on the achievement of more than would be possible if each region done it on their own. Governance, the steering committee, for those who don't know who that is, it's the directors, the chairs, and the vice, and they met six times. They reviewed the progress and prepared the committee meetings. And, as my colleague said already before, but I'm messing up here now, as you could see, Joao and Nicola came to us, and they joined us, and it was very useful to do, because then we could immediately talk to them as a joint committee, what was very helpful, and we also had the opportunity to have the CEOs both coming. So that was really an experience for both WAX and WASM. Thank you for that. Of course, I will not go through all the events we did together, unless you want to. Do you? <laughs> no. <laughs> because I'm quite sure that half of this room was probably in Porto, because that's where we had, at a certain point, three activities going on together. So, we're not going into details, but maybe it's important to know that partnership through specific projects is creating platforms and makes space for network. It access relevant and inspirational information. It improves donor policies and benefit from additional funding streams. Benefit from external expertise, influential volunteering, policies and practices through representations and network at European and national level. I'm sure you saw some of these pictures already, so I will not go through it again and again and repeat what we said. But what you may not know is that we also have a joint visibility sometimes. And we do go to general assemblies with WAX and WASM, or if there's a need from an MO or an NSO that both of us are there, we just do, and you can just try to have, first of all, the two agendas together, and we just come. And then, of course, I cannot forget Rovo. And why can't I forget it? Not because I spent a lot of time with it, not only me, but the entire committee. But also, I'm very proud that we were nagging during the IC forum to have volunteers, and you all really did a good job on that. We had 80 applicants, but unfortunately, I can only take 40 of them next month with me to Rovo. That was an extremely good job of all of you. So, applause to you again. <laughs> of course, talking all these events, this costs money. So I think I better hand over to Rob for this part. And last part, by the way. I think uh, we have heard a lot, and we are not going to tell you what it all costs by um, event by event. But this is only possible because you, as MOs, are willing to pay us a, a massive amount, because more than half of the income comes from you. And that's why we had more than an hour explaining to you what we did in the last triennium, and we are very happy that you give the committee us this money. And uh, uh, because with that money, we have staff because that's the cost, um, not that the staff cost, but they do a lot of work. So as um, I really think it's important, we clap for them because they do a massive part of the work besides the committee, of course. So thank you very much. It's not as interesting, but you see that as well, that uh, we don't allocate staff time to projects, otherwise projects would have looked much bigger. 
So this is uh, outgoing cost from projects. Then at the end, because we have income, uh, we have cost, and then we have kind of reserves. In Berlin, we decided that we could not go lower than the 85K. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't manage to spend it all. Uh, some of that comes because we had not a director for six months, so we were not able to do everything. And when you have a very ambitious plan, then it's very difficult if there is somebody not there for six months. So um, that's why we ended up with more than we hoped we had. But uh, we think we uh, come lower than where we came from. So um, thank you all for this morning so we can do all this work that you have seen last hour. Well, my closing words are just other thank yous to add to all the thank yous. We had so much support, not only the financial one, which is of course the base of everything, but we had support from so many volunteers who worked in so many um, groups and helped us um, to deliver the plan. And we would like to thank you, all the volunteers who are in this room, who have helped us deliver the plan. But we also would like to thank all the MOs who have been constantly supporting us, giving us feedback, formally and informally, and helping us to see where we want us to go. So this is now time for questions. Thank you. What an amazing triennium. And I think I'm convinced now that you really learned to use magic over the last three years. I'm sure you learned how to operate. How else could you have been on all these visits, mentoring things, strategies, develop all these materials, gender task force, 3,000 hours of training on gender, mainstreaming tools, diversity strategy, volunteer task groups, joint visibilities, trainer, etc., etc. So maybe in one of the breaks you tell us how you can use magic as a committee. And thanks, I think this is really worth a big applause for the committee. on the written report, the document number four. So I now ask you um, who would like to ask the committee um, questions? You? Okay, the committee's standing there. So we have, sorry, it's Liechtenstein? Excellent. Liechtenstein followed by Greece. And I would like to ask a question regarding the joint work of external representation. Um, in what aspects did you work together with WASM and um, where do you see this cooperation develop further? Thank you. Okay, Eli is going to answer. Can I ask a question? Um, you sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, so there is joint work in the representation in the forum in the council. Our representatives may uh, preparatory calls. Watch and Bush representatives have made preparatory calls to be prepared for this uh, council of members of the European Forum and the different events. We did have partnership with uh, uh, for the rest, for the advisory council. So and also the European Alliance of Volunteering. So. We do work together. Um, most of the times, it's depending on the people who are representing uh, on how close they will work together, but there is a general framework that we use, and uh, we try to cooperate more. For the future, um, the core groups of external relations have some ideas on how to 
make more effective their uh, joint representation to have more impact for the things of the youth forum. If you want, there are also in the room here people from the external representatives, the core group, it's Lily, Elin, and uh, Monica. Oh, the whole core group is here. And um, also Sarah and Paula uh, are here in the resource group. If you want more information, come and find me or make a second question. Thank you, Elin. Then Paula Mark. Hello, I'm Katerina from The Green. Thank you for the very detailed presentation of the work done in the past training. A lot has been done. However, my question is on finance, which we saw briefly at the end. Um, my question is specifically about the reserves. Lord uh, mentioned how we exceeded about 100,000 uh, euros on the reserves uh, left this training, partly because there was no uh, regional director during a six month period. But I was wondering, since I was under, we were under the understanding that um, money was a tight issue in Europe for different projects or for uh, participation in events. How come we couldn't, um, the committee wasn't aware or uh, didn't release this money during the training to do even more work or to um, uh, include more people in the work done since we did have uh, at least economic resources for it? Okay, and now I would like to collect some more questions so that we get an idea of what other issues we have. Um, so I said Denmark and then followed by Finland. Thank you, Stine from Denmark. We, the Joint Committee of Girl Guides in Denmark, would like to recognize the hard work by the WAX Europe Committee in the past triennium. It is clear to us that the way you have worked with the three thematic strategies and the regional volunteers has strengthened the Europe region on many levels. And we're very grateful for your effort. Finland. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm Ilga Sandlund from Finland. Uh, and this will be more as a, a comment than a question. Uh, so firstly, thanks again uh, for the Europe Region Committee and also for the office for the very hard work. Uh, we were very happy to read about it in the review document. And a special thanks to the excellent oral presentations we just heard that clarified well the written report. Uh, however, we would like to draw your attention to the ways of written reporting. Uh, what we would like to see more is analytical reporting and continuity <coughs> in reporting. We think that what could be developed in the report is the an analytical perspective to the work executed. We would like to see more reflections linked to the aims to get it together with a critical perspective which should, in addition to success, it also include reporting on the challenges and also lessons learned. I think that this is important since uh, it helps us to develop as a region while it also helps MOs to contribute. Uh, we also think that reporting during triennium could be developed. And uh, finally, we are also preparing an amend on this topic to the strategy. So if anybody else is interested in the topic, please come uh, to the Finnish delegation and uh, let's, let's discuss. Thank you. Germany followed by Spain on the list, and afterwards Switzerland. I see. Hi, uh, Fabian. I see. On behalf of the German Federation, I would like to thank you for the great presentations you gave today. And uh, we have another question regarding finances. I draw your attention to uh, the Looking Back report on page 34. There's uh, the budget for 2014, 15, and 16, and there was a um, high increase of the planned budget for 2016 of 30% uh, compared to 2015, and uh, the increase from the two years before was only 4%. So we'd like to get clarification on that point, uh, what happened there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We come back to 
to finance um, one-sided, the first round of questions. Um, we have Spain and then Switzerland. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm Nacho from the CFA in Spain. Um, well, uh, thank you so much for the work done. Uh, however, our uh, question, uh, it's in the visits to the countries. Uh, according to Sharon, Sharon's words, 19 MOs have been visited by their contacts. We, we were just wondering why the rest of MOs didn't receive it. Um, was it because it was not a, prior, a priority for the MOs or, or, or the committee? Was it due to an agenda conflict? Or maybe um, there was not enough finance support? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so the last one, just Switzerland, and then I'll go to the, to the answer of the question. Is that okay? Yeah, but we do the last question, and then we, then we try to answer. Switzerland. Hello, my name is Catherine from Switzerland. Uh, thank you very much for the super detailed report on what we have done. I have to say I'm slightly surprised about how short the report on finance was up on the stage. And um, we have a question about the finances and it actually concerns the fact that uh, we will vote on this looking back report and it contains uh, figures for 2016, which I understand that they are a budget. Since 2016 is not over yet, I think it's difficult to uh, vote on the actuals, which are not really actual yet. And I would like to ask how does the committee see that? Okay, so now we, um, Corona is answering the visit question. Um, which was raised by Spain first. Um, yeah. Okay, I think for the visits, you have to see in a way the two last triennia in combination. You, you might be aware that when the biggest part of the current committee was elected six years ago, um, before that, for a long time, there haven't been many visits done to MOs. Um, they were mainly done in, in the time before us. So before 2010, a lot of visits had been done to work with MOs that were going for full membership. So when we started six years ago, we said our aim is to um, visit all the MOs. So that's why we did quite a lot between 2010 and 2013, um, which was really to get a clear picture what, on what's going on. Um, then we also realized what that means for committee members. And you might remember that in the strategy we had set the goal also that no committee member should travel more than one weekend per month average because we think this is um, an amount of your time that you can ask from volunteers and more is just not feasible and sustainable. So we decided not to visit most again because with many MOs, the situation was clear after the visits we had done between 2010 and 2013. So the visits we did between 13 and 16 now were either the MOs that didn't get a visit in the previous triennium, um, or some MOs where our discussions, it became clear that we needed to visit again, that there was a new issue arising. So it was not that I don't know, we liked those MOs more that we went to visit or we think they are weaker or anything, but it's really to be seen in the context of those two triennia plus the fact that we have really tried and I think we've quite well managed to contain the ask that committee members were asked to do. Um, we have now started to do more visits again and we've planned quite a lot for 2016 using mentors instead of committee members all the time to spread the volunteer hours and travels um, to more people. So I don't know whether that answers your question, Macho, but um, yeah, thank you. Okay, now we have two finance questions. At least I've got three 
on the agenda, one is the question of the type of the issue and the increase of the budget and the reporting. <coughs> I was um, So the first question was from Greece about the reserves and how come. Um, um, oh, I beg your pardon. I do beg your pardon. I wouldn't have any conversations about politics. Uh, so I'm, excuse me, I'm Andy Murphy. <coughs> I had a cough, not good for my presentation tomorrow. Um, I'm the Director of Corporate Services at WAGS. <coughs> So I'm responsible now for the kind of global finance service and all the other backroom support services at WAGS for all of the entities that make up the group. So the question was from Greece about how come the committee didn't appear to know about uh, the availability of money and therefore uh, be able to reallocate that to other uh, activities during the year and not underspend over the course of the triennial. And that's a very good question. So. I'm not in the business of pulling the wool over people's eyes or lying about what went on in the past. And I'm quite happy to say that in the past, the support that the Europe Region Committee received in terms of financial information, um, correct financial advice um, and support in terms of being able to make those strategic decisions about the use of the money that you pay was not good enough. And that started to become real. You know, reality for 2014 when I went to the Europe Regional Committee meeting in, in the Brussels office and I was, I was then told that they'd been told by staff and, staff and other staff that were around at that time that money was too tight to spend on other things and I was there I was concerned that as we were reaching the end of the calendar year I appeared to be understood by a considerable amount. Now it's very difficult for me to go back and undo things that weren't done properly in the past. So what has happened, I'm going to talk more about going forward. So what we've done now, you fundamentally the approach to providing financial support to the Europe Committee. So previously there was an external account firm that did the bookkeeping, provided the management accounts, and then the regional director, as was then, added her interpretation to those figures, made a report to the committee, and they took the decisions on the basis of those figures. The finance department in the Royal Bureau had no input into that process, which I found quite alarming when I first started at Wales. So now, contract with that external accountant, and at the end of last calendar year, we've started to bring the financial uh, administration region and the responsibility for producing reports to my finance team in London. So I can have a proper oversight of what's going on and make sure the quality and the regularity of information that goes to the Europe Committee is adequate for them to fulfil their responsibilities around making decisions about the money that you pay. Now, unfortunately, because that finance team is also dealing with the world's accounts, and I've had some problems of my own in that team at the beginning of this around staffing and staff turnover. We were not able to provide the committee with Q1, quarter one reports as I would have liked. But it is my commitment, and I gave a commitment on this, a personal commitment on this a meeting I, that Rob and I had yesterday. So I am making a personal commitment that from now on, the Europe Regional Committee will get comprehensive and accurate reports on the use of Europe regions from Q2 onwards, and that we will also support them to make sure that that promise that's made in the report about providing at least report to all of you, explaining how the money's been used, is produced, that it's accurate, and building on the feedback that I individually from people, that it includes the kind of information that you want to see to give you the reassurance that your money is being used properly. Um, you know, I come from a background in the public sector in the United Kingdom where financial transparency is absolutely uh, non-negotiable. It's my intention, in the spirit of the new values of WAGS, to make sure that's a reality here as well. Now, I understand, on the basis of conversations that I've had, that people are still worried about this in the report. 
I'm not going to be able to, I'm being honest, to go back and unpick all of those figures. So I'm asking you, as a big Petrustus, and to let me convince you over the course of the next year and the next three years that actually we can manage your money and report on it properly. I think we do manage it properly. The outcomes of all of that, I think, have been demonstrated in the presentation in terms of the great stuff that has been done with your money. But I fully accept that the reporting on finances, both to the committee and you here today, is not what it should be ideal. And I apologise for that on behalf of my hope that you will trust me to improve on that going forward. The question uh, from Germany, why the call cost for 2060%? That's a very easy question because as we know that we have reserves, that means we alter every every year the budget and see what, what's possible. So therefore we increase the budget of 2016 to make sure that we were using the money wisely. And that's why it's uh, we predicted that we would spend much more than the years before. Otherwise we never are going to reduce the reserves. Then the other one on the report, I think it's a good idea to come back uh, with an AGM uh, with a final report on 2014 till 2016 to uh, present to you at the AGM uh, at the next World Conference. But I hope that answers both or all three questions on finance. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for that answer, clear answer, even though you might not answer all the questions, but I think it was a clear statement. Um, so, we now, um, that was all I saw for Q&A, for the questions from, to the report. Okay, no more member organization wishes to speak. I heard also the fins on the reporting, um, and I think it's a good um, opportunity to remind you for the breakout session tomorrow morning, because that's also part of the reporting. And as much as I understood is that you, that the committee also looked into sort of more input issues and what, how can we move with what we've done. So um, it might not cover all of your requests, but it goes into the direction I think you pointed out. Okay, they nodding. Um, so tomorrow morning, breakout sessions for the past training report, we have two rounds on the piece of paper. You find the same timing, but it says round one, round two. So 45 minutes. Please do make sure you sign up for round one and round two. These are tomorrow morning, because people have asked what's the difference of tomorrow morning and tomorrow afternoon and Monday morning. So tomorrow morning, we're looking backwards. Monday and Sunday afternoon, we're looking forward. So. Um, these are different breakout sessions, make sure you yourself into that. So I overran for 10 minutes now, but I checked with Barbara beforehand, so not to worry, the, the candidates will get their time. We are now working 50 minutes till 7 o'clock with the candidates, and I'll ask um, Barbara and her team on to the stage view where I'm going to Hi to everyone. Um, I'm not going to give you a lot of speech. Uh, I'm just going to hand over to um, Elaine and Antonella. They will tell you how we have structured this session for meeting the candidates. This is actually your time to actually talk to the different candidates in a little structured way. Um, so here. Sorry, sorry, Barbara. I forgot one thing to say, and um, Jess reminded me, which is good. Um, I think there was a mistake on on the voting procedure. Let me clarify something. There's a rumours around on voting um, be, due to the new delegate session. So the voting will be you've got six votes. These are across each. Um, so you will get tomorrow the, the ballot paper. And you you cross six um, candidates. It's not that you have one, two, three, four, five, six. You just have six votes. You find that in the rules of procedure, very much in the back as well. So just because there have been rules around that voting is different. Um, it was the old version, very old version. I, I think we are voting quite some time already with only six votes. 
So once more again, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> So welcome to meet the candidates and good evening. Now the candidates will be invited to take a table each. The tables are marked and Barbara has explained before. Each candidate will be wearing a funny headband or hat. So you can easily recognize them. So take a look and uh, see where they are. All delegates are invited to have a chat with the candidate and take as long as you wish. But we encourage you to meet as many candidates as you can.